Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT, the math portion of the GMAT exam. Uh, we're going to be using this book here, the official guide to GMAT 2021. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Because you have to have the book in front of you, you must have the book in front of you in order to be able to follow my work because I'm not going to put down the entire problem on the blackboard which is going to solve the problems. Do you understand? At the end of the video, if you feel that it was useful and if you wish to work with me, if you wish to hire me as your tutor, you can reach me at kashwaniprep at icloud.com, send me an email and we'll see what we can do. Okay? Let's begin. Yesterday we did. The, yesterday we started the story and we did the multiple choice problems. Today we're going to do data sufficiency problems. We're going to alternate every other day. Do you understand? And the, and the data sufficiency problems begin on page number 205. As you can see there, number one is 263. Problem number. Problem number 260. Problem number 263. Which means that there are 260 multiple choice problems. Let's see what it says. The question simply is, how many pages? How many pages? We have a manuscript and we are being asked how many pages does this manuscript, this journal have? And we are given information in the first step and we are told that each page, each page is five and a half by eight. Five and a half by eight. Now before you start these problems, I forgot to do this myself, before you start the problem, always make a habit of writing down A, D, B, C, E. A, D, B, C, E. And I'll explain that in a second or where we're going with it. The mnemonic that I use, mnemonic that I use is that when we write the year, for example, 1998, is it 1998, is it 1998 AD? Or is it 1998 BC? There you go. A, D, B, C, E. That's the mnemonic. That's the memory trick I use to remind myself how it goes. So, tell me. Simply knowing that size of each page is 5.5 by 8, is that, going to enable it, is that going to enable us to find out how many pages this book have? Obviously not. The statement 1 does not have sufficient information. Data sufficiency. Our job is to tell them whether we have sufficient data to be able to answer the question. We don't actually have to solve the problem, we just have to be able to tell whether we have sufficient information or not. Do you understand? And they obviously, simply knowing the size of the page does not tell us anything at all about how many pages the book is going to have. Which means that the answer cannot be A or D. Answers are going to be either out of this group, either A or D, or going to be either B, C or E. These are the two possible groups. If answer is not A, A answer choice A tells us, tells means that information that was given to us in statement 1 is by, is by itself sufficient to answer the question. And answer to us D means the statements that are given to us in both A and B, statement 1 and 2 rather, they are both, statement 1 and 2, they are both independently sufficient, by themselves sufficient to be able to answer the question. The fact that the information that is given to us in answer to us, uh, statement number 1 is not sufficient, which rules out D also, because do, uh, D means that both of the statements independently are enough. Both of them, both of the statements by, by themselves cannot independently be enough because we just told, we just ruled out the fact that A is not enough. You understand? I'm explaining too much probably. Obviously you are here, you're watching the video, you're preparing for GMAT, you know what these answer choices mean. So I'm not going to keep explaining again and again. And if you don't know what these answer choices means, read the bloody thing and learn it. It's all stated there on page number 204. We start the story from page 204, problems begin with page 205, but on page, page 204 they tell you what the answer choices mean. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that there are 250 words, there are 250 words per page. Knowing, <coughs> knowing that, that there are 250 words on each page, does that tell us, is that going to be enough? Are we able to tell how many pages there are in the book simply knowing that there are 250 words on each page? Obviously not. The statement 2 by itself is also not enough. Which means the answer also cannot be C. Answer cannot be C 
because C tells us that if you were to put the statements in two statements together, we can answer the questions. We cannot put the statement uh, information for even even if we were to put two statements together, knowing that each page is five and a half by eight and each page has 250 words, if we were to put the information together from two statements, we still cannot answer the question because they were both worthless, completely worthless. Sometimes what happens is that they give us some information in first statement, but it's not enough. It is useful information, but it's not enough. Here it's not even useful at all. And then they give you some information in second statement, which is useful, but it's not enough. But when we put them together, we can answer the question, in which case the answer would have been C. But here, even, even when we put them together, it doesn't do us anything. The answer is E. The answer is E. Let me get rid of this marker because it's dying. Otherwise I'm going to keep picking it up. Let's move on to pro second problem. I probably was going too slowly. Let's look at second problem. I'm going to pick up speed. Because if we go too slowly it gets too boring. Do you understand? In the second problem we are told that the waves has only roses and tulips. The question is how many tulips do we have? How many tulips do we have? It looks like this marker that I just picked up is also no good. Let's see what they told, what they tell us. The first statement tells us, again, before we do any work at all, we're going to make a note here, A, D, B, C, E. A, D, B, C, E. The first statement tells us that the roses are four times as many as tulips. Whatever the number of tulips we have, we have four times as many roses. Knowing that there are four times as many roses as tulips, is that enough to tell us, for us to be able to tell us how many tulips there are? Obviously not. But as you can clearly see, this is not a worthless information. It might come in handy. We don't know yet. Maybe they will give us something in the second statement. If, if, if in the second statement they tell us how many roses there are, then we can figure out how many tulips there are. But this statement by itself is not enough, which means the answer cannot be A or D. Let's look at second statement. Oh, there we go. It says that the total, total is 20. There you go. Now this statement by itself is also not enough. This statement by itself is also not enough because what this tells us is that roses plus tulips is 20. And from there, we cannot figure out what tulip is. So this statement by itself is also not enough. But if we put them together, aha, that does the job. The answer is C. That's it. We don't actually have to do the work. I hope you understand that part. It is called data sufficiency. We, should, we simply have to be able to tell whether or not we have sufficient data. If you sit there and waste your time to solve the bloody thing, that will be very idiotic, very stupid thing to do, or to, to, to do in the, during the, particularly during the exam, because it's a sheer waste of time, because they're not asking us how many tulips there are. Listen carefully. We are not being asked how many tulips there are. We are not being asked how many tulips there are. What we are being asked is, do we have enough data to be able to figure out, if we wanted to, how many tulips there are? And the answer, of course, is yes, because we have two independent state, two, in two independent equations. One equation is r equals four times t. Other equation, other equation is r plus t is twenty. Since we have two independent equations and two unknown, of course, we can solve how many how many tulips there are. The answer is C. I was about to do them just, just out of curiosity, but it's not necessary because I don't want you to get in a bad habit. Just, just be able to understand whether or just be able to recognize whether we have enough information. Number 265. 265 is asking us what are the coordinates of N. What are, what are the coordinates of point N? I was thinking about point and I wrote down P because of that. What are the coordinates of point N? Let's see what, what is given to us here. So we are given something like this. And we are told that this triangle. Well, let's see what we are told. Oh, that's it. We are not told anything. We are simply told. Oh, we are not given anything at all. Nothing at all. M, N, P, N. This is all that is given to us in the original problem. And the question is, what are the coordinates of point N? Let's see what the first statement tells us. First statement tells us that triangle MNP is an equilateral triangle. 
which we love to talk. As you can see, the statement one by itself is not enough, but it is not worthless, unlike problem number one that we just did, where both of the statements were utterly worthless. Simply knowing what the size of the page is does not tell me how many pages there are in the book, and simply knowing how many words there are on each page does not tell me how many pages are going to be uh, in the book. Those were utterly worthless information in both statement one and statement two. These are not, this is not a useless information. This is actually very useful information. If we have something more in the second statement, we can probably figure out what the coordinates of n are, but by itself is not enough. By itself is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. A, D, B, C, E. Because A by itself, because statement 1 by itself is not enough, answer cannot be A or D. It has to be either B, C, or E. Now, if it turns out, that the second statement gives us just enough information by itself. If the second statement gives us enough information by itself, by itself, without looking at first statement at all, then the answer will be B. If we, if we are able to figure out the answer by looking at both of them together, the answer will be C. If, even if we put the information from both statement 1 and statement 2, and if we still cannot figure out what the coordinates of N are, then the answer will be E. You understand? Let's see what the second statement tells us. I just told you that I'm not going to explain too much, and I, I did it just that. But it's important to understand what these questions are about. These questions are tricky only because of it, because of their because of because of their format. Because this is not typically what we do in the real life in our schooling. We do not come across these kind of questions. We usually come across multiple choice questions. This is not something we usually do. There we go. We are told that the coordinates of M are negative four and zero. Okay, listen carefully. Again, look, don't look at this one. Just looking at the second statement by itself, that does not enable us to tell what the coordinates of n are, which means the answer cannot be b. But if we put them together, aha, now we're getting someplace. If we go put them together, then we know that if it, this is negative 4, this has to be positive 4, because, because the way it's drawn, it's drawn around, around around the origin, around x-axis and y-axis, if you look at the picture properly, there you go. We go, we are getting someplace, which means from m to p is 8, which means m to n is also 8, if we, and this, since this is on y-axis, x coordinate is 0, we just have to figure out this guy, right here is what we have to figure out, and from, from origin to m is 4, there we go. We can very easily figure out what x is, this, this height here, and once we have the height, those are the coordinate. And what do you suppose that's going to be? This x here, the height from here to here, it's, an, it's a right angle triangle. This is a right angle triangle, which means x is simply going to be 8 squared minus 4 squared square root of it. Whatever that turns out to be, we don't have to worry about it. As a matter of fact, what we just did here, we also don't have to do that part. That simply have to be able to recognize that in a right angle triangle, if we know two sides, you can figure out the third side. We do not have to figure out what the bloody thing is. I hope you understand that part. That was a waste of time. I just just, just did it just, just, just because I wanted to show you that it can be done, but it, it didn't need to be done. Don't worry about what that is. Whatever the bloody thing works out to be, that's the coordinate, y coordinate of point n, which means putting the two statements together, it does work. The answer is C. The answer is C. Let's go on to 266. I don't want to go too slowly because otherwise it will take forever and ever to finish. Uh, I want to finish this whole page and it might take forever. 266. In 266 we are told that Na plus 2G costs $12. And this is why it's important that you have the book in front of you. Otherwise, you will not be able to follow my work because I will not babysit you. I'm not here to nanny you. Do you understand? I'm not your nanny. Read the problem. Read the bloody thing yourself. And by A and B, A and G rather, what I mean is, it says the cost of 10 pounds of apple and 2 pounds of grapes is $12. There you go. So A represents the cost of apples per pound and G represents the cost of grapes per pound. Question simply is, how much, how much does a pound of apple cost? How much do a pound of apple cost? What was the cost per pound of apples? There you go. You see, let's look at the first statement. The first statement tells us that the grapes cost $2 per pound. Grapes cost $2 per pound. 
Can we tell from there what the cost per pound of apple is? Yes? Well, let's find out. Of course we can. If we know the value of g, we put it in here. 10a plus 2g equals 12, we are known. We have one equation here from here, and we have second second equation here. Put in the value of g and figure out the a. The statement 1 does the job nicely. Which means in this case, the answer cannot be, oh, I forgot to write down, a, D, B, C, E, which means the answer cannot be B, C or E, the answer has to be either A or D. Now if it turns out when we look at the second statement and we realize the second statement also by itself gives us enough information to be able to answer the question, then the answer would be D. If the second statement by itself does not have enough information, then the answer would be A. Let's see what second statement says. Second statement tells us that two pounds of where did I get bananas? I got two bees. There are no bananas here. I must have gone bananas while I was writing it. Two pounds of apples, not bees. Two pounds of apples cost less than one pound of grapes. Well, simply knowing that two pounds of apples cost less than cost less than one pound of grapes does not enable us to be able to tell what the cost of apple is. This information is worthless. The answer is A. Now, had this information been enough by itself, by itself, enough to answer the question, if we were able to figure out what A is by itself, then the answer would have been D. 267. 267. 267 says... What's the median salary? What's the median? What's the median salary of a whole bunch of people, whole bunch of employees? What was the median salary for the employees of comp company X? First statement tells us. First statement tells us that there are there are twenty nine employees. Twenty nine employees. Is that information enough? Well, of course, it's not enough. Simply knowing that there are twenty nine people in the in the company does not enable us to figure out what the median salary is but it's also but it's also not utterly worthless information it does have some useful bits the useful bit is the fact that since there are 29 people if we subtract one from it which is the middle guy we are left with 28 which means there are 14 people here 14 people here then this is the median and there are 14 people here In other words, the median is the fifteenth guy. The salary of the fifteenth guy is the median. But there is, we cannot figure out what the salary of the fifteenth guy is. But now we do know that we have to figure out the salary of the fifteenth guy once we arrange them in order. But by itself is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. By itself is not enough, which means the answer cannot be A or D. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us. Hopefully, second, st second statement tells us that 12 had, 12 had annual salary of 24,000. No, we don't need 12. If they had told us that the, well, even if they had told us that the 14 people in the company had annual salary of 24,000, that still would not have been enough because we don't know which 14 but certainly 12 is not going to do it we cannot figure out the median from there that statement by itself does not do it putting them together doesn't do anything because when we put them together what we realize is that this tells us that we need the 15th guy and this guy and this this is just telling us what the story of the 12 people is neither of those statements neither of those statements by, them, by themselves or by putting them together is enough the answer is E we cannot answer the question at all 268 268 It says how many how many x equal 250 y's Listen carefully how many axes equal 250 y's? That's all we have to answer. Let's see what it says. First statement says, 
And again, the question of course is phrased a little bit differently. I'm going to leave it up to you to read the thing yourself. Obviously, it's, uh, it's phrased a little bit differently. It says, how many, how many basic units of currency X is equivalent to the 250 basic units of currency Y? I'm, I'm going to stop doing that. You, go, you, read the, your, you, you read it yourself. So first statement tells us that 100X equals 625Y. Again, without having to do any work at all, I hope that you're able to tell that this information is enough. If I know how many, I, if I know 625Y is equal to 100X, then obviously I can figure out how many, 20, how many X's would be 250Y's. That's all. We don't have to actually have to do that. Now, just out of curiosity, this is not something you would do in the exam. Just for the learning purposes, it's very simple. We divide both sides by 625, and that will tell us that 1Y, 1Y equals 100 over 625 axis. We don't want 1Y, we want 250Y. The question is, 250Y's equal how many axes? So multiply both sides by 250, and this is going to get confusing because now the multiplication sign, there you go, this is much better. Multiply it by 250, and whatever that works out to be, that's your answer. Do you understand? Divide top and bottom by 25, Divide by top and bottom by 25 and it becomes 10. And we still have to keep going. Let's divide by 5. This becomes 5, this becomes 2. And let's divide 5 again, so this becomes 20. 20 times 2. Turns out that 250y equals 40 axis. It equals 40 axis. But this was a waste of time. This was an utter waste of time. Do you understand? Now, second thing. In case you had trouble what I did here, I divided top and bottom by 25, that's how we got the 10 here. 250 divided by 25 is 10, and 625, I hope that you're able to see that 625 is a square of 25. This is not something that I need to have to explain to you. If you are sitting for the GMAT, then nobody should have to explain to you what a square of 25 is, something that you should know by heart. There are basic things that you must know. And if you don't, it's about time that you learn. I'm going to tell you a video that you can watch. Uh, that will help you uh, that will help you learn the squares whenever you're looking for a certain topic any topic at all in the math just type in my name Keshwani and then type in whatever topic that you want to look for here we want to learn the squares just type in Keshwani and then put in know your squares know your squares a video will pop up a video which is going to say video which is going to say basic math day 30 and the reason it's called basic math is because that's exactly what I do there we learn very basic of the math there are 100 videos dealing with very basic concepts in mathematics actually I think there are 200 I'm not sure that video will pop up watch the video and learn your squares if you don't know them Two hundred and sixty-nine. We are still on the same page, you understand? Because it has quite a few problems. We still have two more to go after 269. In 269 we are told blast it. I didn't do 269 ahead of time. I don't have 269. I missed it. 270. It says we bought three P's and one S. Again, I don't know what P and S's are. You read it yourself. We bought three printers and one scanner. The question is, how much does one scanner cost? How much does How much does one scanner cost? Let's see what, the, what is given to us. The first statement tells us that we paid total of $1300. A, D, B, C, E. Simply knowing that you spend a total of $1300 is not going to be able to tell us what one scanner costs. But again, this is not a useless information. It is actually very useful information. <coughs> Hopefully, we'll get something more out in the second statement and putting the together, putting the two together, maybe we can answer the question.
but this by itself gives us the first equation which is the fact that we bought three printers and P represents the price of printer and we bought one scanner together they cost $1300 so we have one equation and two unknown P and S we can't solve it second first statement by itself is not enough which means that it cannot be A or D it has to be either B, C or E second statement tells us that the printer costs four times as much as scanner printer costs four times as much as scanner again by itself it does not do any good at all simply knowing it costs four times as much does not enable us to figure out what's, what a scanner costs by itself is not enough which means the answer is not B but I hope that you are able to see immediately immediately that putting the two statements together we have enough information to figure out what, the, what, what a scanner is going to cost because now we have two independent equations two it's important they have to be independent, that the equations are independent. We have two independent equations and two unknown. Of course, we can figure out the value of the, the cost of the printer and the cost of the scanner. The answer is C. The answer is C. But we don't have to do it. We do not have to do it. But if you have bent on it, it's very simple. P equals 4 times S. Just put it in there. P equals 4 times S and that's all there is. 4 times this is 12, 12 plus 1 is 13, there you go, 13 scanners cost $1300, each scanner cost $100, but that was a waste of precious few seconds. And even though they are just few seconds, they are precious nonetheless, because we have limited supply of them. 271, 271, the last one on the page and then we'll stop. Page, uh, number 271 question is what's the, what's the, what is the angle BAC? Let's see the picture. Let's look at the picture here. Picture is off. It is given something like this. A, B, C and D. Question is what is angle BAC? B B A C B A C would be this 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 angle. This is what we're looking for. That's what we're looking for. Let's look at what the first statement tells us. The first statement tells us that the angle B D C equals 60 degrees. B D C equals 60 degrees. I'm going to change the color so that we can keep the information that is given to us. In the original problem and what is given to us first statement we can keep them separate so let's look at BDC BDC this is 60 degrees now in something like this of course you have to actually solve it a little bit because otherwise it's difficult to figure out there you go if this is 60 then this guy must be 120 this guy must be 120 they must tell us something about angle B oh yes they did I left it out angle B is 20 I should put in a black one because it was given to us it was given to us that angle it was given to us that AB, ABD is 20. Well, if, if this is 20 and this is 120, of course we can figure out A. The statement 1 by itself is enough. A, D, B, C, E. Statement 1 by itself is enough. The answer has to be either A or D. Answer cannot be B, C or E. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that... Second statement tells us that the angle B, A, C is smaller than angle BCD. Again, if we erase all of this thing, this is all that is given to us. That is all that is given to us. And simply knowing that BAC, BSC, this angle that we, that we're looking for, the angle that we're being asked, know, knowing that that is uh, that angle is smaller than BCD, BCD, knowing that this angle is smaller than that angle, does not enable us to figure out what that angle is. Second statement by itself is worthless. A, D, B, C, E. So when, once, when we figured out that the first statement by itself was enough, we crossed out B, C, and E. At that point, at that point, the answer had to be either A or D. So the second statement by itself is not enough, the answer is A. Answer is A. And that is all there is. That is all there is 
As I said before in the beginning of the video, if you want to get hold of me, send me an email at kashwaniprep at icloud.com. I'll be more than happy to do what I can. And that Keshwani, I should know how to spell my name. It has an I at the end. So just anytime you're looking for any particular topic in math, just type in my name Keshwani, because otherwise without my name you're gonna be there are a thousand other there are a thousand other people doing the same thing that I am, obviously. So type in my name Keshwani and then type in the name of the topic and it will pop right up. I'll see you tomorrow, and tomorrow we'll be back to multiple choice problems. We're gonna alternate. You understand? Bye now.